Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third day now of our summer school. So as we said, like in the first day, we were looking at some uh, pathophysiology to try to understand the basics. Yesterday, we were looking at imaging, image analysis, data analysis that you need. And today, we will start with really like the core modeling, let's say it that way. So talking about the models. And it's my real pr pleasure to welcome Blanca Rodriguez. She's professor of computational medicine in the University of Oxford. And for years, she's been working on models, especially of electrophysiology, uh, cardiac electrophysiology at the cellular level. But again, as we try to emphasize in the summer school, it's like always this going back from data to models to experimental models and try to iterate in this, like never look at things in a very isolated way. And this is exactly what Blanca is doing. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Please. Thank you. Let, let me just check out this is working well and not too long. Yeah? Right, so um, I, I will be talking today um, about research we do in Oxford. Um, and I will try to, to give an overview of what uh, computational models have delivered in cardiovascular science with an emphasis in cardiac electrophysiology, which is my field. Um, uh, the, the main emphasis is, as Bart was saying, uh, in explaining how computer models need necessarily to be linked to a research question, but also to the experimental data that can be obtained in, in any in, uh, particular field. So, f for me, these are the main challenges in biomedicine. So, the main challenge is, the main challenge is in explaining phenotypes. Uh, and especially in disease. Uh, and I think we need to understand computer modeling in light of these challenges. Because when we are asked what has computer modeling delivered, we are always assessed in relation with other areas of biomedicine, experimental and clinical. So the, for me, the main challenge in, in biomedicine is in explaining phenotypes, especially in disease. The links between genotype to phenotype, and we were just having a conversation about that. Uh, understanding the interplay between structure and function, very often we have different modalities assessing structure and function, and it is very hard to link them both. Uh, understanding population heterogeneity, and I think increasingly there is science pointing towards the huge importance of environmental factors in determining phenotypes. So genotypes is easy to measure. Understanding environmental factors is really, really hard. And I think modeling and simulation has a, a, a key role to play in understanding all these challenges. So uh, another challenge in, biomedical, uh, in biomedicine is the huge variety of biomedical data. In cardiac electrophysiology, we have in vivo uh, non-invasive measurements, mostly from imaging, but also uh, functional data like the electrocardiogram. We also have in vivo invasive uh, recordings from catheters and biopsies. And the difference between non-invasive and invasive is that the actual method of recording it is having an effect on the experimental data you are obtaining. And that needs to be taken into account in the interpretation. We have ex vivo recordings and in vitro recordings. The most important thing for me, in light with the challenges I highlighted, is that these data provide one snapshot on the time of the recording. They don't characterize the phenotype per se, because that changes over time very often, especially for the heart, but they provide one snapshot. They are also multi-scale, so often they give you information at one particular scale, and either on structure or, on fu or function. So, it's a huge challenge to actually interpret these data sets. And there are a variety of techniques that are used in biomedicine. When we are assessed, our grant applications are assessed for funding, usually we are evaluated in this context. We are evaluated not in the value of modeling and simulation per se, but they, we are evaluated in, is there any other way of looking at this problem that would be more fruitful? And this is something that can only <laughs> be seen when you are in, pa in, panel, in panels for funding. So <clears throat> there are different ways of looking at the data. And the very accepted one is statistics. So medical doctors are trained in statistics. 
and that's one way of, of doing it. Image analysis and signal analysis are also well accepted. And uh, modeling and simulation is starting to be more accepted, but we are still a minority. And we need to demonstrate what is the value of modeling and simulation compared to other methods of analysis. Increasingly, we are seeing uh, examples of use of machine learning and also crowdsourcing. So these are becoming really fashionable um, in science. We still need to see what is to come and what can be shown they, they are producing. There is also, because, because deep learning is also very fashionable, um, more people are, are trying to apply these deep learning methodologies to biomedical data. And this is an, another area of increasing interest. Now, what I, would, what I will do, because we are in the VPH summer school, is to focus on modeling and simulation. But I think it is really, really important to emphasize that when we are evaluated, we are evaluated with respect to all these other imaging uh, and signal processing techniques. So if there is a better way to look at the problem, don't use modeling and simulation. Because you, you, people will ask you why, why using modeling and simulation for that, even if it's your background. So I looked in the PubMed, I did a PubMed search, uh, and I looked at how many papers have been published with uh, computational model, mathematical model, or computer simulations in silico in the last years. And you can see here an increase in the number of publications. Uh, I wanted to have a feeling for how many were specialized publications or publications in specialized journals or publications in very, very high impact journals where we are uh, showing uh, very new uh, research find findings that are likely to have a huge impact. So of all of these, a, a small amount are in these sort of publications. I'm not saying these are the most valuable ones, but certainly when we are assessed with respect to other fields, we need to prove that we are at the cutting edge of research. And I wanted to see how many were published in journals that are considered to be cutting edge. So there is an effort to be, to be made to move modeling and simulation at the forefront of research in biomedical science. So in, in cardiac electrophysiology, uh, everything starts in 1960 with Lenny Snobel actually publishing in Nature the, the first model of the cardiac action potential. It was a very simple model with sodium and, and potassium currents, and he was able to simulate the cardiac action potential. Um, this, is, this is an example of the computed action and pace, pacemaker potentials and the, the ionic currents. This model was absolutely wrong. It was completely wrong in that he only assumed two currents, sodium and potassium, to be active in the cardiac cells. We now know a lot more about this cardiac action potential. And in fact, in 1960s, we know that the action potential in the cardiac cells is uh, the response of the cell to an electrical stimulus. And it is uh, due to the opening and closing of a variety of ion channels in the membrane. So this, now we know that uh, the, the cardiac action potential in the, in, the, in the human cells is due to a large number of ionic currents that are produced by channels opening and closing randomly uh, due to an, an electrical stimulus that is delivered to the cell. The thing is, even, the, even though the Dennis Noble cardiac action potential model was absolutely wrong in its assumptions of only two currents, it has been extremely useful in the discovery of these ion channels. It has been used over the years to show how some of these channels are needed to reproduce the behavior of human cells. And this is, I think, is the most important role of modeling and simulation in a constant iteration between experiments and simulations to aid and accelerate the discovery of new um, mechanisms. So at present, this is the picture of how cardiac models are produced in cardiac electrophysiology. We, have, we start usually with ionic current measurements, usually with voltage clamp, and these are obtained for each of the currents that I just showed in the slide before. These, these ionic current measurements are far from being non-invasive. 
So the first thing we do with the cells is to isolate them. And this creates a lot of pressure on the cells. And some of the ion channels in the cells are destroyed. So the single cell isolated from the tissue is completely different to a single cell in, in the intact tissue. And the first thing is to know that these ionic current measurements are just an approximation of the kinetics of this ionic current. And we just don't know how they operate in tissue. The first assumption we made when we constructed computer models is that the kinetics of these currents are intact. So we trust them. But the actual conductance of the amplitudes of these currents would be very different in intact tissue. And that's an assumption we made because otherwise we wouldn't know how these ion channels operate. So in terms of equations, this is the equation of the sodium current uh, that is present in all the excitable cells. It has a maximum conductance that is the product of how much current flows through one single channel and the number of channels, the gates, and a driving force that depends on um, electric field and concentrations gradient. So these kinetics are determined by these recordings. And we trust the recordings in giving us information on this part of the equation. This one here depends on the number of channels. And it's very much affected by the isolation procedure that allows us to record these cells. So this one is going to be variable, and it's unknown and cannot be measured directly. So once we have an equation for each of the ionic currents, we put it together in a system of ordinary differential equations that allow us to simulate the action potential. And then we have a way to compare with other recordings that can be obta obtained either optically or through microelectrode recordings. Now, uh, until very recently, uh, people were proposing a single model of the action potential of the cardiac cell. So we were all assuming that one simulation that was deterministic of the action potential would equal the action potential of all the, of the cells that we all have in all our human hearts. And this has been going on for a long time. The, the way we, we simulate the propagation through the, uh, through the heart is by using uh, an established model that is the bi-domain equations, which is two partial differential equations coupled through this action potential model here. And this allows us to simulate the electrical excitation through the ventricles or the atria. And there are different ways of appro uh, 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 approximation from the bi-domain model, which is quite time consuming, also because the problem is very stiff because of this sodium current. Uh, so we can approximate depending on what is the research question we want to answer by monodomain, iconal, or graph-based methods. And we have compared these methods, and people have used them for different, different things. So technically, we know how to simulate the electrical excitation in the whole ventricles. This actually gives us a very good link with some imaging modalities, and especially uh, anatomical models. So because we know the function from ion to whole organ, we can also obtain information from in vivo electrograms and uh, MRI or CT scans in order to link structure and function, which is a very, very important um, aim of the simulations. By the way, you can stop me if you want, and if there are any questions. So the way I've explained computer models until now is as a representation. So we are trying to represent the ionic current in the cells. We are trying to represent the, um, the propagation of electrical excitation. We are aiming to represent the anatomy of the heart. And this is one way of looking at the models that allows us to develop new models and new techniques. In fact, the field has advanced very, very much in terms of representation. And what I'm showing here is two examples of papers that, are pull, that <coughs> have pushed the boundaries of what we can simulate in terms of the heart and have focused not only on the electrical part, but also on the mechanical and the hemo hemodynamics. And this way of understanding models as representations, as way to capture reality or to capture the data, is one way that allows us to discover new ways, new, new ways uh, to 
um, new methods and new uh, mathematical techniques and new numerical techniques that allow us to uh, simulate increasingly complicated functions of the heart. So this is what I would call the first type of simulation studies, the ones that aim to build models and develop techniques and tools. And those understand models as representations. Um, the, the main aim here, and it's important to understand, is technology development, to push the boundaries of what can be done computationally. And the outcome is technology, it's software, it's mathematical models, it's numerics. Um, they identify needs for new developments, like adding the Purkinje system, or cardiac mechanics, or fluid dynamics. Uh, they are very much based on computer science and mathematics, and they provide a toolkit that allow us to uh, simulate, to, to, to um, um, they, they provide the opportunity for simulation studies to answer biological questions, but they don't answer the biological questions per se. It's a, a way of understanding models as representations in a domain that is computer science and mathematics. What I want to emphasize is that that's not the only way of doing modeling and simulation. And another type of simulation studies is the ones that aim at answering a biological question. And that's very much the context in which we work in my group. Let me just drink some water. <laughs> so this second type of simulation study very much starts with a scientific question that we want to investigate. And that uh, needs to be evaluated based on experimental techniques that are available and experimental data that are available to build the models, which was the first one, to evaluate them against experiments. And I'm going to avoid the term validation here. And we could have a discussion about it if you want. But I'm going to avoid the term validation, which probably more of you are used to. And I will use evaluate or even qualify which are alternative terms for validation that raise less expectations, okay? So we, we build the models and evaluate them based on the scientific question we very much want to in, uh, investigate. And if there is much in the evaluation between the experiments, then we investigate this research question and we may propose new experiments. If there is lack of much, for me it's always an opportunity for discoveries. What is missing in the model that uh, provides this lack of much. Is it that we haven't built a model with sound mathematical techniques, or is it that a, a, an important component is missing in the model that we need to incorporate? So this is the framework for the types of studies that we evaluate. In this, in this framework here, the models are not only seen as representations, and they, they have an, a representational component when we build the models and we evaluate them, but they are seen as tools to to discover something. So there is always these two sides of the coin in computer models in biomedicine. One is they need to represent, but the, the real value is what they, they help discovery and, and how they are seen as tools for discovery. And I would argue that the greatest discoveries have, have come when models were far away from being accurate representations of the system, but they were simple models that uh, were used as tools very effectively. So this is an example of this simulation study type two that I did when I was in the US with Natalia Trajanova. We built a model, I didn't actually, I was very lucky when I got to the lab because Jamie Eason had uh, developed with some students like Felipe Aguel, a computer model of the rabbit ventricles. It was the, the first by domain model of the rabbit ventricles. And it allowed us to investigate the effect of electric shocks on the heart. And this, is, this was very, very important at the time because there weren't any studies on the effect of anatomy and the effect of electric shocks, which is very relevant to defibrillation studies. And we were collaborating with Igor Efimov, who was doing optical mapping studies. So we had a way to compare the rabbit model to the experiments. So we, the model was built and we had to evaluate how the model was performing uh, compared to experiments. Now, interestingly, I received two, two, dates, uh, two, two data sets from Igor. One was early experiments, 
and they actually agreed really well with my simulation. And then I got a second set of experiments and they didn't agree. So the second set of rabbits had arrhythmias like crazy. So you, you, you could generate arrhythmias in those hearts very easily compared to the first ones. And I asked Igor what was the difference between the two. And he said that the second set, they were much older rabbits. So it turns out that the older rabbits were very prone to arrhythmias compared to the young ones. So I thought, why, why is that that my model agrees with the young rabbits rather than the old rabbits? And the reason is because my ventricular model was very homogeneous, very smooth. It didn't have any fibrosis. It was all young. So in reality, what happened is that my model was a model of a rab rabbit, young rabbit heart, which didn't incorporate any fibrosis or any heterogeneities. And I learned a bit more about my model. So actually, if you see a rabbit heart, you, you would see how, how that is used in experiments. You would see how smooth it is compared to the human hearts that, are used, that, that you can see in the clinic or uh, in pictures. So it's actually a very important difference between the animal experiments and the, and the human hearts. So I, I learned what type of experiments I had to use to compare my model to, and I learned through the process. What we did is was quite complicated, and I won't go into detail into it, but what we were doing is comparing the experiments with the simulations and looking at how similar the, the effect of an electric shock in the heart was between experiments and simulations. And actually, it was quite consistent, and what we were looking in this evaluation and in this comparison between experiments and simulations was looking for consistency. How consistent were the, uh, the results of my simulations compared to the experiments? And what I was doing through it was building credibility in, in my model, which is a very important uh, a step in the evaluation of the models. And in any publication that is of this type, we need to have a section, not on validation per se, because we, we will never be sure that the model agrees with reality, and actually that's not the, the aim. But we were looking for consistency and increasing the credibility of the model. So in this case, we went forward and we could prove that the model and the experiments agreed. And actually one critical difficulty in all of this was here. We had one model, but we had different experiments. And the data analysis was critical to show consistency. If we had five models, all of five experiments all giving different results, how do I compare with a single model that gives me a single result? And I, I spent ages producing this figure that showed consistency, but with very different frameworks in experiments and simulations. And this is where I started to be interested in viability and heterogeneity uh, in different hearts. So, in, in the validation, evaluation, qualification of the models, what we're looking for is consistency and credibility of the model simulation and experiment system. So, when the, the comparison between experiments and simulations fail, it's not the model that is wrong. It's the model simulation experimental system. If I had been comparing my model with the experiments with old rabbit hearts, it's not that the model is wrong is that it doesn't match the experiments that I'm comparing to. So what we put forward uh, in, a, in a collaboration with my friend Ana Maria Carusi, who's a philosopher of science, is that the evaluation of the models is not an evaluation of the models per se. It's the evaluation of a system that is the model simulation and experimental system that needs to be consistent in order to build credibility. It may be that the numerical methods are flawed, not necessarily that the model is wrong. I think that's a very superficial statement that we very often see in um, after presentations of models and simulations. So um, this evaluation for me is critical and it needs to be considering the model simulation and experimental system. We then, once we did this, we, we built a model, we evaluated against experiments, then we went on to investigate what were the mechanisms underlying some of the phenomena we had seen in the models. So in this type of studies, we build a model, we evaluate it against experiments, and then we add value. What can modeling and simulation tell us 
that we couldn't do experimentally. In this case, the, the experiments had a big, a big uh, limitation. They only provide information on the surface of the heart. So with modeling and simulation, we could provide information of what happened inside the heart. And that was the added value we were obtaining with the models and the simulations. So that actually is very, very important when we want to publish high impact papers. We need to build a model, we need to evaluate it against experiments. If there is much, we investigate the question. Um, and we need to, in, to provide with models and simulations something that the experiments can do. In, in this case, it was to look inside the heart. In some other studies, it was about ionic mechanisms. But it is usually about understanding mechanisms of something that is observed experimentally. This is the third type of simulation study that we, that I would propose, which is when there is a follow-up, when the predictions of the model are tested experimentally. So in this case, we build a simple model, a 1D fiber of the cardiac cell, and we wanted to investigate uh, the adaptation of the QT interval with an increase in heart rate. So clinically, it has been shown that when you go up the stairs, your action potential duration shortens or your QT interval shortens. And that the way in which it shortens, the dynamics are related to sudden cardiac death. So people who don't adapt very well to exercise are at higher risk to, um, to die suddenly. So that has been shown clinically and we wanted to understand what were the mechanism underlying this process. Why this QT interval shortens and why people who are at risk of dying suddenly uh, would have problems adapting uh, the, uh, with the adaptation of the QT interval. So we build a model and we compare two experiments. And we saw that the action potential duration in the experiments it does indeed shorten, just in the, in the simulations and in, in the experiments. And we investigated the mechanisms. So through the modeling, which I won't go into the detail, we showed that it was the sodium dynamics that led to the shortening of the action potential duration. And in fact, it all depended on one ionic process, the sodium potassium pump. We could have published that paper in six months and Esther Pueyo was leading the research. So in six months, we built the model, we conducted the simulation studies, and we identified that the sodium potassium pump was the key uh, player in this. But what if the model is wrong? We had no way of evaluating whether the sodium potassium pump was indeed critical or it was a model art artifact. So what we did is we asked our experimental collaborators to test it. We came up with an experiment that, um, that could uh, test whether the predictions of our model were true or not. And what they did is to block the sodium potassium pump and they measured this APD adaptation. So in this study, we went from building a model, evaluating it with respect to what we wanted to investigate, and then testing the predictions of the model with other experiments. And so this took another one year and a half, and Esther was very, very keen to wait for it to happen, and the paper was much more interesting and much more grounded. In fact, uh, the first question that they asked me when I went for interview for this fellowship that I'm holding at the moment was, can you give me an example of a study like this, where you build a model, you investigate something, it leads to a prediction, and that actually is tested experimentally. Can you show me that in your research you've done that? Because so many of the modeling studies are about, I build a model, I show something, and I publish it some, somewhere, and it's never tested. So this type of approach where we investigate something and then we test it experimentally is what more biomedical scientists would see as of value. Extremely challenging, rather than six months, it took two years, but if you have the time, it's, it's worth it. So when planning a simulation study, I, I've seen eternal moanings, right? We never have enough data, the data are never enough, and they are usually not very good compared to what we expect as uh, people trained in mathematics and in computer science and engineering. So th there is an eternal moaning I've, I've seen over the years. There are never enough data, especially if they are clinical and they involve patients, they are 
hard to obtain, but I assume nobody would like clinicians to play with your heart very much. Um, so the numerics are numerical approximation, so there is no exact solution, and there's sources of uncertainty in there too. Models are wrong, that I see all the time when people come with a mathematical background, models are wrong, so what? Yes, they are. So there is always a trade-off between important and feasible in the world of imperfection, okay? So we are dealing with imperfection in biology, we are dealing, especially if, if we deal with clinical data, but what is it that we can do to improve things is the question. So when, when I plan a sim simulation study, I always ask questions like, why is the simulation study needed here? What are the limitations of the experiments we want to overcome with the modeling and simulation study? What is the scientific question and why it is important? If it is not an important question, go and do something else. If it's so only a study that you can do and it's easy, ask yourself whether it's really worth it because it, it can always take time. So then, once you have the research question, define the model, the simulation and the experimental system and, and the, their limitations. Evaluate the computational and numerical feasibility and that's always a given. The numerical methods need to be sound. Define the experimental data needed and available for each step. So if you're gonna think of of what is the best possible outcome of this modeling and simulation study? And do you have the means to test the next step? Do you have the experimental collaborators that would allow you to test the predictions of your model? If you don't, it's okay, they might appear in the future, but I think it is worth considering whether the predictions can be tested at least. And try to anticipate what the best outcome of the study could be. So if you discover something amazing, is it really going to be truly amazing? And identify the type of experiments that could confirm your findings and who can them do them. I think experimental collaborators are key and they are very, very difficult to nurture. So it is also important to know how to handle the collaborations. We were talking about authorships in papers and. So I, I, the more and more I, I deal with these things, I deal with them as with the companies, with uh, industrial partners, when we actually even write agreements. What's the project about? Who's gonna do what? Who is gonna be co-authoring the paper? And it's almost like the way we work with uh, industry is actually very good to work with uh, experimental and clinical collaborators to actually have very clear agreements from the beginning. So once you have done all of these, usually you need to refine the scientific question because you, you are overly ambitious or not very ambitious. So it's an iterative process. I, if you haven't come across um, Uri Allen, I really rec recommend his papers on how to choose a scientific problem. He's a genius communicator and he has tons of videos online on systems biology. And he has very, very good papers uh, on systems biology in general. This is a figure from one of his papers that shows how you think a scientific project is gonna go from A to B, straight line, and actually how it usually is, and you end up in C, and you don't know how you, you, um, you got there. Especially that's true for PhDs, actually. Right, so, um, I'm going to, to illustrate a bit what I think a cardiac modeling and simulation have delivered so far and what are the challenges ahead, but in light with the challenges of biomedicine that I, saw, I, I showed before. So I, I like this, this uh, picture of the dance by Matisse, and I do think the more, the more I think about modeling and simulation, that the more I think it's a dance with uh, experiments and clinical data, and that is how it needs to be understood. So this is again uh, Dennis Noble's model. And he has, if you're interested in, in um, iterations between experiments and simulations, Dennis Noble has a, a paper in Heart Rhythm that was a lecture that he delivered where he talks about how the models have helped discover new things in cardiac cellular electrophysiology. And he already talked about uh, the iterative interaction between experiment and simulation uh, that we'll, we will gain that understanding of, of the human heart. 
Um, it's a really important paper, I think, and one that I always give to people who say models are wrong. And yeah. So this is again uh, what I showed before, and how in that paper, Dennis describes how the iteration between models and the simulations has helped discover new ion channels. Uh, I will refer to this. I, I have also this, I don't mean to, to say that Dennis was prehistoric. I mean just to say that these models were a representation of reality that was useful at that time, and that has been useful to discover something that looks more realistic, but is still a tool. This is the picture of uh, the different type of models that have been produced in the meantime. So the, you can see here the names of the first authors and the dates, and uh, this shows the animal species. So they are huge amounts of models now developed for the action potential of the cardiac cell. And the assumption is always the same, that the parameter set is unique. So in all of these models, it's always been identifying the parameter values as unique deterministic values. So again, the action potential model for the rabbit is a single thing that would be the same for all the rabbits, or for all the cells in all the rabbits all the time um, in the world. So um, the, the contribution of these models has been huge. And I would highlight this model because I think it, it's a very, very important milestone. This model is the mo a model that Tom O'Hara produced with Joram Brudy with data from Andras Varro and Laszlo Virag. It's the model of the human ventricular cell, um, and it, has, it was uh, developed using human data. Uh, they spend a lot of time uh, obtaining this human data. I highlight it because it's the first time the, that the a regulator, the, you, the FDA, is considering the use of a, modeling, of a model for regulatory purposes. So if you're, you're not aware of this, um, the Food and Drug Administration, which is responsible for the safety of medicines in the US, launched this uh, uh, CEPA study for prorhythmia pro, pro um, uh, pro safety assessment. So what they wanted to do is to replace the thorough QT study, which is a study based on uh, healthy individuals, people like you and I, go to the clinic and they take drugs and they measure the QT interval uh, in order to assess whether it's safe or not. So in July 2013, the FDA announced that they wanted to replace this clinical study through, uh, by the use of a model study and the use of stem cell derived cardiomyocyte. The, I was there, so when, when they announced it, um, they announced it one day to pharmaceutical companies, and the next day they had organized uh, meetings with experts to see whether that was possible or not. So for me, it was the other way around, but it was literally like that. On the 23rd, there was the meeting announcing to co uh, pharmaceutical companies that they wanted to change things and introduce modeling and simulation, and everybody was really scared and all, everybody was complaining a lot. And the next day, we had a meeting where we were assessing whether that was possible or not. So for me, it's a milestone because what the FDA wants to, to do is use this model. The ohara Rudy model in particular, they think it's good enough and we know enough of the cardiac electrophysiology that we can use it to evaluate the safety of drugs. Now, we didn't think all the research had been done to prove that this model had everything it takes to assess whether a drug is safe or not. But we are, have been doing a lot of research and we are doing research with them. And it does seem that the model can be a very useful tool to predict the safety of cardiac drugs. So I think we have reached a milestone in cardiac modeling where things are not just about scientific questions and uh, discovering new things and answering new questions. It may be that we are going in the direction of using cardiac models instead of clinical studies in healthy volunteers and instead of animal studies. And I think it's really, really important. So if we look at the citations of these models here, of these papers, you can see that some of them ha have been cited hundreds of times. So what has this, this scientific research led to? So they are over a thousand models who have, or a thousand papers who have used the Lua Rudy model so what are they about? What have we discovered with them? One of the key, key topics uh, that I think was pioneered by Colin Clancy and Joram Rudy 
is linking genotype to phenotype. There are tons of papers that have had a very good contribution to understanding how genetic mutations, and especially those affecting channels, channelopathies, can affect, uh, can, can lead to a phenotype that can be assessed in the clinic. This linking uh, genetic defect and cellular phenotypes, uh, this paper is a 1999 paper, so it's a long time ago, but since then a lot of papers have done this type of research, and they are becoming increasingly important because of all the research that is very being done in, uh, in genomics. So one of our roles will be to integrate the knowledge that is uh, obtained from the genetics of the cardiac disease and any other type of disease to explain phenotypes. This is um, another study that I, I really recommend reading, which I think is also another milestone in, in, uh, in the use of cardiac models. This study made use of a clinical database combining two elements, um, a, a database of uh, 633 subjects with a mutation uh, uh, called LQT1. Uh, sorry, yes, so the subjects had one mutation and this database included 34 mutations and a model that was quite simple actually. So it was a 1D fiber model like you see here and it allows to um, simulate the propagation of the action potential through the fiber and calculate the transmittal dispersion of repolarization. So quite simple and in fact the people here like Jeremy Rice and Matthias Royman, they have the means to compute much bigger models. They have the means to compute whole heart models with electromechanics and everything. But they chose a quite simple model for this project. And one should ask, so we should ask ourselves why they did that. Why having the possibility of computing huge uh, cardiac electromechanical models, they chose a simple model that was a 1D fiber to calculate uh, transmural dispersion of repolarization as a way to predict the clinical outcomes. I haven't discussed this with them, but I would assume that if they did it, there was a reason. And one reason is that the clinics need simple solutions. So if they didn't go for a more complicated thing, it's one because this might be enough, a 1D fiber model that can run in a desktop, but also because a single model that can run in a desktop could be used by doctors. And the big electromechanical models at the moment um, can only be run in supercomputers and that's complicated for doctors. So this paper showed that using a 1D fiber model and the information on these 34 mutations, we could predict clinical outcomes um, quite efficiently. So I think it was a very important paper showing multi-scale modeling linking mutations to a clinical phenotype and uh, that made it a very high impact journal. This linking uh, genotype and phenotype has been shown in other fields and it's because it's a challenge in biomedicine we're going to see a lot more papers like this. This is on tooth. So it's uh, on teeth and, and the development origins of morphological variation. So it's a letter in nature that also shows the uh, ma ma mathematical model linking uh, genotype to phenotype. Another uh, important contribution of cardiac models has been in uh, the understanding of ventricular fibrillation. So um, ventricular fibrillation is the, the, the main cause of sudden cardiac death. So when people drop dead, just if they are athletes, sometimes it happens because they have a mutation, because they have a cardiomyopathy they didn't know about. Um, very often it's uh, because of a heart attack is happening, so the occlusion of a coronary artery. And uh, ventricular fibrillation happens because spiral waves develop in the heart, so rather than a very synchronous contraction, things start to go nuts, and the spiral waves start to occur in the heart. So the first time that this was shown uh, was in a mathematical model was in 1946. And in the, in very, very early on, people were showing that mathematically you could predict the occurrence of these uh, spiral waves. It's only when they discover optical dyes in the 1990s that uh, people in Khalifa's lab started to measure these spiral waves in the heart. So the mathematical models preceded the uh, experimental recording by 50 years. 
And because they were understood, they were also able to interpret them in the experiments. Rick Ray is now in the, in the FDA, actually. So he's, uh, he's pioneering the use of modeling and simulation also for devices like uh, defibrillation. But he was uh, an academic doing optical mapping, one of the first optical mapping studies um, of um, reentry in the heart. Defibrillation is another field that has been pioneered by modeling and simulation. So it's the application of very high energy electric shock to reset the heart. And we published a paper, Natalia Trojanova, um, uh, where we talk about how modeling and simulation have helped understanding the, the effect of these electric shocks. It's actually interesting because there was a lot of research going on in defibrillation some years ago, but things have stopped a bit. And I wonder why people have stopped understanding, the, uh, trying to investigate the effect of electric shocks in the heart. I did a lot of research on defibrillation, and one of my difficulties and why I stopped is because it's very hard to obtain data that can be used to um, in conjunction with the models and experiment and simulations. So it was kind of easy to do research with bi-domain models and it's becoming increasingly easy to do um, simulations of bi-domain uh, models. But it is much harder to actually get data to uh, evaluate those predictions. And it's an area where there is a huge clinical need, but not very, very, very many people are, are studying it. It was actually um, in, in, the 19, eight, in 1989 when the first simulations of the effect of a point stimulation were showing how the polarization of the tissue when, when a point stimulation was applied was very complicated. And what they showed in John Wick's was lab is that the effect of the electric shock on the heart depended on structure. So what the, the simulations were able to show with a passive model, so not even an active model with ionic currents, was that the effect of the electric shock very much depended on the fiber orientation. And that set the scene for a lot of studies that um, included these experimental studies showing the same thing as these simulations, where they show that the polarization of the tissue and the electric shock would depend on the structure. This discovery was hugely important because it means that people who have an abnormal structure would have an abnormal delivery of the electric shock. And it is very, very important to understand structural uh, abnormalities in the heart to understand a defibrillation and how a defibrillator can be um, effective. So again, in this case, it was modeling that showed predictions that were matched by experiments in the same lab, actually, a few years ago. These people are physicists. So for, the phys for, for people who have studied physics, it's pretty much the same to do a mathematical model than the experiments using optical mapping. They are used to and trained to do experimentation and mathematical modeling. So I think for them, it was much easier to construct the model, show predictions, and then do it the experiments themselves. For most of us, that's, high, that's quite complicated. I have a computational lab, and I, have, I don't have the means to do the experiments. So it becomes a challenge of social abilities to actually build the collaborations, to actually do these type of things, where you want to test the predictions of the model in the lab yourself. So it was quite impressive, really. The, uh, these early studies that show how structure affects electrical function have grown. And actually, I didn't have time to, um, to change this, this slide here. But Natalia Trojanova just, has just published a paper in Nature Communication that I think is also a milestone and it's worth to look at. It was just published a few weeks ago. Uh, the study shows how uh, models, anatomical models obtained from MRI can be used to predict sudden cardiac death in a cohort of patients. So it's for the first time an image-based study of cardiac electrophysiology shows clinical potential. This is uh, early studies that were, were um, published in the same uh, area. So this one, for example, was using pig hearts with, um, to show uh, ventricular tachycardia a circuit of ventricular tachycardia, and then there has been another paper by King's published 
recently on this. Natalia's, the recent one on nature communication, is the first one showing the, uh, the, the potential of these MRIs based models of cardiac electrophysiology to predict a clinical outcome. So I think it's quite important and it opens quite a lot of doors for us. In, in, I, I think just to, to finish as part of my talk, I, I, I was told that we cannot have a break, but so we're just gonna have to do this. This is, this is quite, quite uh, um, exciting for us. And it's studies where we're trying to understand phenotypes in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a disease that is inherited. So it has a genetic component. And it's characterized by the thickening of the left ventricles. So in some patients, the ventricles are thicker. And in addition to this thickening, there is electrophysiological remodeling. So the properties of the ion channels are uh, abnormal. So the important feature of this, uh, of this uh, disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, is that the phenotype is very heterogeneous. So people having this disease can, can show very different phenotypes. And we wanted to investigate. We have a, a database that includes electrocardiograms and MRI. And we wanted to investigate whether we could discriminate different phenotypes using just the QRS in the electrocardiogram. So using just the first bit of the electrocardiogram that is determined by electrical activation. The main underlying hypothesis here is that abnormalities in the structure of the ventricles would affect activation sequence more, and that would be reflected in the QRS. So um, the different phenotypes could be determined by this QRS morphology. This is a database. It, the numbers have grown a bit now, but um, it's a rare disease, so it's not easy to get uh, patients. We are getting more patients, but not with holters. Um, so the holters are 24-hour recording, so they allow also um, rate dynamics to be investigated. And the study was done blindly on the ECG only, so we didn't have all the clinical data on MRI and genotype data when we did the ECG analysis. We investigated uh, different features on the QRS. So uh, we did some uh, QRS signal processing analysis to obtain standard biomarkers, like the QRS width is the most standard one. And most people think that QRS would be longer in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients because the hearts are bigger, and therefore it would take longer for the, for the wave to propagate. But in fact, that doesn't seem to be the case. And what, then we did some, because we're geeks, we did some mathematical modeling uh, of the QRS, and we approximated the QRS waveform through um, a, a set of basic uh, Hermit functions. And the coefficients would tell us how similar the QRS is to each of these bases. So what we did then is, one, one is, um, a binary classification. So based on these QRS features, can we identify control from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? This was interesting, but actually not for the clinicians. So for us, it was in interesting. Can we do this? Can we differentiate healthy with respect to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? But the, the clinicians said we can do that already, so that's not very interesting. The most interesting bit is whether you can identify clusters of patients. So can you discriminate patients that have a different phenotype. Can you tell us whether there are patients that have a normal QRS, an abnormal T wave, that have a, a very abnormal QRS, and whether those clusters are related to clinical uh, phenotypes at all? So we did this. The first thing is that the, the standard biomarkers didn't show any differences between control and HCM. So this belief that the QRS width is longer in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy wasn't shown in the data. There were people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a normal QRS width, and none of the other biomarkers uh, led us to any good classification between the two because there is overlap between healthy and HCM. So we did this clustering analysis, and we did see three clusters in the data. And uh, in this cluster here, the cluster one that you see here, the patients had a very normal QRS complex. So they didn't seem to have any abnormalities in the activation sequence. While, whereas the cluster three were clearly people with very, very uh, normal, abnormal QRS complex. 
um, these ones were intermediate. And what is more interesting is when we looked at the T wave, the patients that had a very normal QRS had a very abnormal regularization sequence. So not only the syndrome is, the, the, the disease is quite heterogeneous, it's hard to understand the findings. So we, we looked at the differences in the clinical data between the three clusters. Uh, genotype didn't tell us anything. So we couldn't see any difference in genotype between the three clusters, but the numbers are not enough. So we want to increase the numbers of patients to actually understand a bit more what's going on. The, the cluster three uh, who were patients with a very abnormal phenotype had a very abnormal wall thickness and a higher ejection fraction, so that was significant. But what was interesting is that the cluster one, which, uh, and these other patients who had a very normal QRS, were at higher risk of syncope. So normal QRS, high risk of syncope, abnormal QRS, um, abnormal wall, wall thickness and ejection fraction. So we are trying to understand this a little bit more. We did some analysis of the ECG, trying to understand these things. So this is an example of a QRS of a patient in cluster three, which is very, we called it wavy, and the clinician said fractionated. So it was an interesting exercise of, uh, of uh, language. So we, we tried to understand why, why these things happen. Also in cluster three, the, the, the abnormalities in the QRS are related to areas in the, in the heart that, that are areas that were, had a, a normal structure. So they didn't correspond to abnormal thickness. They corresponded to late activation uh, sequences. So there is a lot we don't understand on this. The QRS abnormalities uh, cannot be explained by the location of the maximum uh, LV hypertrophy in cardiac MRI. They, they might be explained by other things, and I have a hypothesis about it, but we, did, we couldn't correlate with MRI uh, wall thickness. So what we are doing now, uh, and this is also a collaboration with Barcelona, is to build patient-specific uh, models of the anatomy of these patients based on the MRI with information on the ionic currents to surface body potentials in order to understand these QRS morphologies, and whether the, the modeling and simulation can help us explain these different phenotypes in the patients, because we cannot do it with the data themselves. We need to build more complicated models that allow us to do this. Now, the problem itself is highly complicated. The models are huge, they need high-performance computing, and it's just recently that we were able to um, simulate the activation sequence in these patients. I'm not sure this is. So this is, this is work that Anna Minchole and Ernesto Thakur did with a lot of people, and uh, it's based on an anatomy of one of the healthy volunteers, and we were able to simulate the ECG for this patient, for this healthy volunteer. So I wouldn't say this is the ECG of this person. What I would say is, this is the ECG that comes out when we incorporate the anatomy of this patient, which is different. So this is going to be a tool, which we haven't done yet. This is going to be a tool that is going to allow us to assess how the information that we obtain from the patients in terms of the structure, what's the anatomy of the ventricles, what's the fiber orientation, what are the abnormalities in fiber orientation, how much that can explain the electrical phenotype and the abnormalities in the QRS. Um, it's very exciting and it's certainly an area where you cannot do it without modeling and simulation and I think that's what makes it more interesting for me. The idea of all of this and the vision behind it is also to use this type of very complicated models for in silico trials for drugs and devices. So if we construct a, an atlas of models or a population of virtual hearts, uh, we can use them in, in order to test the efficacy or the safety of drugs. And this is something we're doing at the single cell level already with a bunch of companies and with the FDA as well. We are trying to evaluate how the computer models allow us to predict the safety or the efficacy of a treatment. But we can take it to a bigger level where we incorporate not only single cell dynamics, but also um, differences in anatomy, in body mass index, 
in structure in the models, and we can go towards uh, multi-scale models of the heart that allow us to test the efficacy and the safety of drugs and electrical therapy uh, in silico before going in, in, into clinical trials. Okay, so this would be all preclinical testing, but very useful so, and we have now some doors open towards uh, doing that. This is uh, an example of a simulation of uh, the atria, uh, the propagation in the human atria as well. And at the moment we have only one, one anatomy, but this doesn't mean we cannot create other anatomies. And in fact, given the, the, the big progress in, in MRI-based modeling, I think we can do it. The electrophysiology is, is harder, I think. So uh, just to finish, I think, I think the, the going from images and data into constructing models from electrical decodings is something that is really, really challenging. Uh, and we kind of know how to do at the moment. And I think it's a really a promising area to be looking at the effect of mutations on the uh, different phenotypes. We can look at the, the effect of structural defects on, um, on, on the function of the heart. Or many things that we have been doing very well, I think, for many years. Now, I think the main challenge for us and for biomedicine is to look at population heterogeneity due to environmental factors. And for that, I mean anything that is external to the thing. So if it's a cell, it's what is regulating the cell that is not internal to it, like a genetic defect. When it's a body, what is regulating our behavior, like what we eat, circadian rhythms, whether it's day or night. So the more, there, there are more, more and more papers, for example, that are showing that the maximum ionic conductances that we all have been considering as parameters in our model are not parameters, they are variables. And they are variables that are regulated by what, what we eat, hormones. So there is a paper showing how testosterone can increase the potassium channel by 30%. And that actually protects men from arrhythmias. So we, in the models, we have always been assuming that certain things are parameters, and we believe it. I mean, we've been saying it to us ourselves for so many years that we believe that the number of ion channels in, in our cells is constant, and it's not. It's actually a way of cardiac cells of adapting to environmental factors. If we eat sugar, if our hormones change, if uh, it's day or night, if temper temperature changes, or we, if we take drugs, the number of ion channels in our cells is going to change and it's going to help us adapt to those environmental factors. That actually has a very strong influence on our phenotype. And we don't know how to measure it, and we are not going to be able to measure it, and we, are not going to, and we don't know how to deal with that huge uncertainty. I mean, some people call it uncertainty and they try to capture mathematically using Bayesian approaches and stuff. For me, it's just an unknown. Our, our hearts, our organs are open <coughs> systems that are affected by environmental factors. And we can measure things in the lab or in the clinic, but this will change the, the, the next moment where the patient goes away from theater. I went to the, cardiac, to the cath lab the other day to look at an arrhythmia, a patient who was having an arrhythmia, and it was very consistent and they wanted to ablate. The patient went into the cath lab and the arrhythmia disappeared. That happens all the time. And that's just a proof of how much of an open system our organs are. So as mathematically, as mathematically minded people, we want to capture things in, in, uh, in uh, equations and using parameters. But actually, we need to understand that reality is very different. And biological systems are open, and they are affected by these environmental factors. How to treat them? I don't know. So, the, the way we, deal, we dealt with this in this study was uh, brute force, really. So this is, uh, these are recordings that are, are taken in human hearts using a sock of electrodes. So literally, the, the surgeon and uh, the clinicians, Pierre Lambiaz and Peter Target, 
put a, a, a sock of electrodes around the heart of, of patients that are going to go for surgery. And they obtain electrical recordings. Um, we used uh, the ohara Rudy model that I mentioned before in this study. And what we did is to construct populations of models, rather than a single model, we, we used thousands of models with different parameter values to capture the data. And this was based on methodology that we published a few years ago. So rather than using one model, we used thousands of models that had the same equations, but the parameter values were different. And we only kept the models in red, which were the models that were in range with the electrical recordings. So we call this a population of models calibrated with the experimental data, in this case, uh, in vivo clinical recordings. The, you can call it uncertainty in the parameters in vivo is huge. So what we assume is that it, it can vary quite a lot. And what we wanted to investigate is two phenotypes that were observed in vivo. So these are, uh, these are different cycle lengths or rates. And what we observe is some patients had alternance, which is um, bit to bit variations in APD, in action potential duration, that were closing at high facing rates. And other patients looked at uh, how, uh, showed uh, folk type alternance that were consistently observed at high pacing rates. So the first thing is that the models were able to replicate these two phenotypes. And then what we did is we investigated the ionic basis of these alternates, and we looked at, again, what is the added value of these models. So we were able to replicate these two phenotypes, and the added value of the modeling and simulation that cannot be uh, done uh, clinically is to show what, what was different between these two phenotypes. And it was all very complicated, uh, very complicated systems biology that only a person like Shinzu can do which was digging, 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 digging into the actual mechanisms of this calcium uh, uh, dynamics. And we showed that these differences in alternance were actually uh, due to a difference in the L-type calcium current. What she did is uh, to actually look for an antiarrhythmic strategy in these patients, uh, for these patients that display alternance, and looked at how blocking the sodium calcium exchanger could lead to the disappearance of alternance. Now, the, the, whole, the whole framework uh, for this investigation was based on the fact that we don't know what the ionic currents are in those patients, and we can never know. So let's go for a modeling approach that explores a variety of mechanisms that, that is absolutely wrong in claiming that these uh, models represent those patients, but that allows us to explore different possibilities. And what if we block the sodium calcium exchanger? What would happen here? So to me, the, the importance of environmental factors and population heterogeneity and the many factors that affect our heart calls from a different approach to modeling and simulation that is far away from let's define what is the conductance of this particular cell at this particular time and explore things from a much free way uh, using uh, creative approaches. There, there are a number of papers uh, calling for this type of approach, and this one is quite interesting, the universally sloppy parameter sensitivities in, in systems biology models. And it's worth reading and then coming up with our own solutions. What I think is also important is be tolerant, because we are in a world <laughs> of modeling and simulation where we are exploring the use of modeling and simulation for different scenarios, and there isn't one single solution. We need to explore the use of modeling simulation in many different ways. So one, considering models of as representations, another one is considering models as tools, and nobody can claim that we have discovered the best way of doing this. It's a bit of a mess, really. So uh, just, just to finish, um, for me, computer models are tools with a representational instrument. So it's ideal when you have the best possible tool for the, for the thing you want to investigate. But often actually choosing um, a different one uh, is going to do the job and you are gonna get your publication faster. And sometimes uh, timing is really, really important. Uh, I don't mean not going for a, the ideal. I think this is the absolute best. But sometimes going with a tool that does the job can, can be really fruitful. And if somebody uses the wrong tool to wash 
a glass and it breaks, it's not the tool that was wrong, it was the use of it. So for me, using models uh, needs to be evaluated in the context of the simulation and experimental system. Um, and, and we always need to think about models as tools with a representational instrument. So in conclusion, so computer models for, from, from, for me are tools for exploration and discovery. And it is important to assess the success or failure of the model with respect to the discovery. Um, cardiac research is full of discoveries through iterations between computer models, simulations, and experiments in basic science and uh, increasingly in translational and clinical settings. And, and I'm very happy to see uh, studies that are reaching the clinical uh, journals. The biggest challenge ahead is viability due, due to environmental challenges. And this is not just for modeling and simulation, it's for biomedicine in general and precision, precision, pre precision medicine and personalized medicine. It's a hugely important problem. And, and we need to come up with creative approaches uh, that help us exploiting models as tools to explore the effect of this viability. So there is increased complexity in what we do in modeling and simulation. And we often collaborate in teams. Uh, and we are specialized in one area, but um, we work in interdisciplinary collaborations, which I think is very important in a, um, accelerating impact in biomedicine. And it, it calls for, I, I think, from tolerance, really. So, so from trying to understand the perspective of other people who come, who come, who come from a different perspective. And the typical one is clinicians and, and engineers, but there are many others. And, I was given a very useful tool for that, which is the principle of charity. And it's when somebody tells you something, always assume that they are very smart. and They are coming from a very valid point, And that actually makes the research much stronger in our setting. And I think that's all from me. And thanks for uh, the very long talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for the splendid overview. Um, Let's maybe start a little bit provocative. I think from some of the things that you said, I seem to be able to conclude that personalized models, like a lot of people are trying to make, like patient personalized models, you say are never going to work. Well, I, I mean, that was really not what I meant, but <laughs> because we're doing that as well. What I, what I mean is it depends on what we claim. So I, I think it depends on what we are trying to claim with them. So for example, um, the study I was referring to that Natalia Trianova has published now, they are working. So in fact, uh, I discussed this with her. So she's taking her study, if you haven't seen it. So her study takes MRIs from patients that have myocardial infarction, and she constructs an anatomical model of that heart with a scar personalized for each of the patients. And then she runs simulation studies uh, of arrhythmias. And then she uses that to predict the risk of these patients to have uh, arrhythmias in reality. So that she has a database for that. So the models are personalized only in terms of the anatomy. And a lot of people thought she would fail because there is no way that if you don't personalize for the function for the, electri for the electrophysiology, this would work. But they are working. So my question to her was all, has always been, so what do we learn from this? So if you personalize only for the scar and the anatomy, and you are able to predict risk in that cohort of patients, what do we learn? One is that the electrophysiology in those patients is not critical for the arrhythmia. So for me, it's great that it works. It won't work for all the patients. And, and that's where I come with tolerance. I'm not going to come here and say they're never going to work, because I think they are, and they are working, even if we, we didn't anticipate that it didn't. So I think, for me, it's great that she's showing that it can work in that setting. But I also think there are other ways of doing things that are, are equally valid. And what I don't want is people to think that patient-specific modeling is the only way to go, because it's not. Because for environmental factors, for example, it would be quite challenging. So for me, it's, 
let's explore what modeling and simulation can do. So patient-specific modeling, yeah, go for it. Show that it, it's going to work. But there are other approaches that don't take that turn that can be equally valid for phenotyping. Yeah? No, I totally agree with you. The only thing is that sometimes reviewers don't agree that if you come with a simpler model that answer the questions, they say like, why didn't you do a 3D personalized model yeah. in order to do it? So still there's work to go there. That, that yeah, but sure. also I think that's also educating reviewers not to be a pain in the ass. For the <laughs> <laughs> I think that's impossible, unfortunately. Well, I, I mean, let's be critically constructive, right? It, especially in this. So I, I sit in a panel for funding and um, in the Wellcome Trust. And the people who really know how to do this constructive criticism is neuroscientists. So neuroscience is a community of people who criticize very constructively. They are very friendly and they always get the funding. And other communities are perhaps less mature in terms of interdisciplinarity or in terms of how we review papers and applications. And you can clearly see that different communities have different takes on, of the, on things. I think neuroscientists are doing very great. So we can learn from them. Yeah. Now, another question that you partially uh, touched also, and that's a thing that we, for example, are struggling with also, and I know several people are struggling with, is what you say is indeed this variability, the whether you call it uncertainty or variability or changes with environmental factors and things like that. But the question is, how do we deal with it? You showed like one is brute force. The other thing is some people are claiming like maybe in our mathematics we have to try to integrate it from the beginning or do maybe some kind of machine learning or there is like, what's your view on all these different kind of approaches? I mean, wh wh what I think is that all, all the methods are, need to be tested. So, so this is a huge problem. And so for me, uncertainty quantification and viability are different things. So one, uh, in terms, for example, on how we do uncertainty quantification for um, determining the conductivities in the tissue. So conductivities in the tissue come from structure that is going to change uh, very slowly, probably. So we can consider that as a, as a parameter because it, the changes are going to happen with years, right? Age and... So I think using Bayesian approaches to estimate uncertainties coming from the data and identify uncertainty and quantify uncertainty in that setting makes sense. I, I cannot anticipate whether somebody is going to have a very, very clever idea to do things in a different way in the future, and they will come up with a better solution, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, conductances of ion channels are a different problem because they cannot be measured, and they change really rapidly. And in a matter of a, a day, they can change by, by 30%. So, and that's what we know of what happens in a dish. They cannot be measured because the, the, the electro, uh, electrical recordings are done in isolated cells that are damaged. So we don't know what they are in tissue and when we take them from the heart. So for me, ionic currents are about viability, not uncertainty. I mean, we, there is uncertainty, but the huge problem is not uncertainty, it's viability. Is they, they are varying now as we speak. You know, your channels are changing. And uh, they are being affected by day and night, um, temperature, what we eat. So for me, that is a different problem. And, and it calls from a different approach and we, because we are dealing with, with variables that are not parameters. So you, you can try to, to use Bayesian approaches for that problem. But I think the assumptions you're making in, this, in the, the use of Bayesian approaches to investigate uncertainty are so huge and so not um, supported by biology or experiments that perhaps other approaches are going to be more useful. But I think it's worth exploring all of them. I mean, there is no, no reason for not going for all of them and trying to see what is more useful in what setting. The, the intolerant view that it needs to be one way, I think, damages science. And what about measurement in accuracy? Because that's another one that you have. Would you treat it differently from variability or is it better to include it together? We include it together because we have no means of differentiating. So we just, yeah, I mean, it's a huge problem, but uh, 
the measurements are the, the ones we have. Uh, th there are also different ways of, of dealing with variability. So, the, uh, um, so people in the US, Eric Sabi and David Cristini, rather than using the population of models that we are doing, are using a different approach, which is coming up with uh, algorithm, so uh, coming, coming up with um, stimulation protocols in cells that would allow you to estimate the parameters more robustly. So rather, rather than that, doing traditional electrophysiology in the lab, doing much more sophisticated electrical measurements in cells uh, in order to obtain models for specific cells. And I think there they want to control the experimental error as well. So what they do is they, they do very extensive uh, stimulation protocols in a limited number of cells, and they come up with models that are specific for those 10 cells. Now, I think that's really important work. They can only do that in animal cells because the human tissue is not going to be given for that. So if people have human tissue for their own experiments, it's very rare because it's so not available. People won't give it to somebody else to do their experiments to construct a model, specific model. So they, they use guinea pigs, they use rats, they use... And they can control experimental error over there. They can control things in a much better way. But when, when you talk about human experiments, you, you are given what you're given from your collaborators. Um, you're very restricted. So you need to deal with the, especially if it's in vivo, how many variables are affecting the human heart, the error, how do you estimate that? It's, it's not under your control, even if you have a very good relationship with them. It's yeah, partially related to that. It's like you have a lot of experience with cellular work and things like that, mm. which is mainly done in a really controlled way, but yeah. you also have been working with clinical kind of uh, things. The data that you get from clinicians is totally different, both in quantity and quality, than what you get from biologists or, or cellular electrophysiologists. Yeah. Do you change your approaches based on that? Or do you say like, okay, this is what we have and we try the same approach? So we change the approach, yeah, and we try to, to do our best. So yeah, of course we change our approach. And, and we, but but it, peop, so reality is reality, okay? So reality comes from you, you are given what you are given. So cl clinically you cannot do more. So if Pierre and Peter are putting a sock around the heart of certain patients, and we get those rec recordings uh, from Michele Orini, actually. So we do what we, so we are grateful to the patient that has allowed us to do that. We don't go and ask, oh, actually, can you put this drug on the patient? Because, so you, you, can, you are working in a setting that is not mathematics, it's reality. So it's reality of people who undergo a surgery, it's reality of the uh, recordings that are done in an invasive way. Those hearts are not in the body, they are it's open chest. So I think in doing the, in designing the modeling and simulation study, it's very important to take into account what reality is. So when a pure mathematician comes and says, oh, I would use Bayesian approaches because that's the word, and say, okay, let me, t let me tell you my story. <laughs> so it's, it, we are hybrids. We're not any more pure engineers or mathematicians. Yeah. Any other questions? Coffee time. <laughs> Good. Thank, Thank you, you again. Thank Thanks. you very much. <laughs>